introduce routing yesterday. We'll continue and look at uh, fixed routing and look at routing tables and other strategies for routing. So we introduced fixed routing where we said that what we do when we build the network, we calculate the least cost paths and store them in the nodes and we use those paths for the duration of the network. And there's something major changes in the network, a major topology change, for example. The problem or the advantage is that it's simple. We just create the routes once and we use them for the duration of the network. It's not very good in that because the network conditions change over time, maybe there's a lot of traffic in one portion of the network, this approach will not care about that. It will keep using that congested portion of the network if it's on the path. It will not change the route to a route around that congestion. So it's not very flexible from that perspective. We'll see, I think, strategy three is adaptive routing, which is the same except it allows our routing protocols to continually recalculate the best path to adapt over time. And we said, okay, in this example network, there are 30 least cost paths with six nodes. From one node, we need paths for the five other nodes. So there's five. And from every node, we need to do that. So five times six is 30 least cost paths. And you could go around or go away and calculate them if you like. One of them we calculated was, and we used as an example, To go from N1 to N6, the least cost path was 1, 4, 5, 6. Uh, sometimes I'll omit N just to save space and time. And it actually had a cost of 4 units. 1, 4, 5, 6. And the last point that we made yesterday was that because the path cost is the summation of the costs of the links on that path, if this is true, the path from 1 to 6 is from 4, 5 to 6, then it's also true that the least cost path from 4 to 6 must be 4, 5, 6. Why? Because if there was another path, path from 4 to 6, so 4, 5, 6 we know has a cost of 3 units. If this wasn't true, if there was a path with a lower cost than 3, 4 to some other node, to 6, which had a cost of 2, for example, if this was true, then it means this is not the least cost path from 1 to 6. Because if there's a path from 4 to 6 with a cost of 2, then there must be a path from 1 to 6 with a cost of 1 to 4, which has a cost of 1, plus this segment, 4 to x, and x to 6, which has a cost of 2, which has a total cost of 3. So if there was a path with a lower cost than 3, from 4 to 6, then it means this is not the least cost path. But we know this is the least cost path, which implies that this must be the least or a least cost path from 4 to 6. This cannot be true. If we did have a lower one, this would not be true. Any questions on that? That's an important concept to get your head around because we use that when we simplify the storage of information in routing tables. So 
this cannot be true, that is we cannot have a path from 4 to 6 with lower cost than 3 because we have this. As a result, we immediately know the path from 5 to 6 is direct 5 to 6. Given this, you know that the path from 4 to 6 is 4, 5, 6, and from 5 to 6 is 5, 6. And similar for other paths. As a result, what we need to do is calculate all the least cost paths, all 30 of them, and then store that information in the nodes. Let's say that we store this information in each of the nodes. Node 1 stores the path from N1 to N6 is 1, 4, 5, 6. So this is stored at node 1 in some database. And in node 4, we store the information from N1 to N6. The path is 1, 4, 5, 6. And similar from node 5, we store the same path. <coughs> That's what we need to do. As a result, if we store that information, node 1 has a packet to send. And that packet has a source address. So now we have a packet to send from node 1, has some data. In the header, it has a source. The source is node 1, and the destination is node 6. So what the node 1 will do is look at the source and destination and look at this data stored at node 1. It needs to find the path from node 1 to node 6. If this is stored in some database at node 1, it sees, OK, my source is N1, my destination is N6. I look up, there may be other values, we've just got one of them here. N1 to N6, my path is 1, 4, 5, 6. That was calculated prior to all this happening. Therefore, I need to send this packet to node 4, the next node in the path. So, node 1 sends that packet to node 4. Node 4 receives the packet. The source is still node 1. The destination is still node 6. Node 4 receives this, looks at the source and destination, looks at the data stored at node 1. To get from node 1 to node 6, node 4 should send to node 5. So now, node 4 sends this packet to node 5. Node 5 receives the packet, looks at the source and destination, looks up the data stored in its database. To reach node 6, node 5 needs to send to node 6. So node 5 sends the packet to node 6. Node 6 receives the packet, notices that node 6 is the destination of this data and processes the data. We've delivered the data from 1 to 6. That's how switching works the forwarding of packets through the network, and that's how we use the routing information. This information here, that is the least cost path from 1 to 6, was obtained from some routing algorithm which calculated the paths and stored them in a database. And then we just use that information to deliver the packet across the network. We can simplify the information that we store in the database. Instead of storing the entire path, we can store just the first or the next node in the path because of this reason. That is, at node 1, store the next node to reach node 6 is node 4. And at node 4, store the next node to reach node 6 is 5. And at node 5, store the next node is 6. That is, 
in the database at node 1, do not store the entire path, just store the next node. Instead of storing 1, 2, 3, 4 values, we store just one value. And at this node, instead of storing 1, 4, 5, 6, we store the value 5. And here we store the value 6 instead of the entire path. So it simplifies the information that we need to store in each node, the database here. And it simplifies the distribution of this information if we need to share it with other nodes. So in fact, we don't store the entire path, we store the next node in the path. And we get the same result. Source creates a packet, destination node 6, looks in its table here. To reach node 6, the next node is 4. Send the packet to node 4. Node 4 looks up, source 1, destination 6, Next node is 5, send to node 5. Node 5, next node is 6, send to node 6. We've delivered the packet across the least cost path. This information that's stored, in particular this part and the next node, is stored in what's called a routing table or a routing database. So a node determines the least cost paths to all possible destinations. Node 1, to reach node 6, this is the least cost path. Node 1, to reach node 5, would calculate another least cost path. And to node 4, node 3, and node 2. So it had five least cost paths calculated from the perspective of source node N1. We do not store the entire path we store only the next node in the path. And optionally, we can store the cost of the path. So what we do from the perspective of one source node, we have a table with, say, three columns. What is the destination? What is the next node in the least cost path to reach that destination? And optionally, what is the cost of that path? From node one, it would store destination node 6, next node 4, path cost, whatever we had, 4, I think. We don't need the path cost, but often it's stored. Node 4 would have a routing table. In one row, it would say destination node 6, next node 5, and possibly the cost. So in fact, what we need to store is destination node and next node. And that simplifies what we need to store at each node. And this is called the routing table or a routing table. A routing table may be stored at individual nodes, like we may have here. Node 1 stores this information. Node 4 stores this information. Or it could be all in one central node. There's a special node in the network that stores all the information. That's possible as well. And we can separate the concepts of routing and forwarding. Routing is the process for discovering the route, the least cost route. Forwarding is the process of using that route to deliver the data across the network. That is, finding out what is the least cost path from 1 to 6 is a part of routing. Send, sending the data from 1 to 6, sending this packet, is forwarding. And they are related because when we forward this packet from 1 to 4 to 5 to 6, we are using the information that was found from routing. So routing, find the paths, store them in routing tables. Forwarding, use those routing tables to deliver the packet across the, from source to destination. So, here's a routing table. As an example, find the routing table for node 1. That is, 
Node 1 needs to know the path to all possible destinations, the least cost paths. And from that, you can construct a routing table. Try and construct the routing table for node 1. Try it yourself. I've already given you one entry in the routing table. Node 1 to reach node 6, next node is 4. But what about if node 1 wants to reach node 2? What is the next node? And what about to reach node 3? What is the next node? So start calculating the routing table for node 1. No need to copy this, or this is not relevant for the answer here. You should try to find out the routing table for node 1. Then I'll come around and look at your answers in a moment. And maybe find a volunteer to write it on the board. This is for later. you're trying to fill in this information. This is a routing table for a particular node. What is the destination? What is the next node in the least cost path? You don't need to do the cost. You can if you like. But these are the most important two columns. You'll have multiple rows in this table. We already have one row of information. If node 1 wants to reach node 6, we've already calculated the next node is 4. If the destination is 6, next node is node 4. The cost of that path is 4. What about to reach other destinations? For example, node 2. Node 3, Node 4, no, Node 5.
has a routing table? I can't see many complete tables yet. There's, so the point that we tried to make before is that we need to find the least cost path, but we only need to store the next node in the path because in our example before, if from 1 to 6, the next node was 4. The next node from, from 1's perspective was 4. So we deliver the data to 4. When 4 receives it, and knows we now need to go from 4 to 6, the path from 4 to 6, the least cost path, is 4, 5, 6. And the path from 1 to 6 was 1 to 4, <coughs> 5, 6. So if node 1 gets it to node 4, then node 4 will deliver it to node 6 across the least cost path. So in fact, node 4 will deliver to 5 because 5 is the next node on its least cost path. And then 5 will deliver to 6 across the least, path, least cost path from 5 to 6, which will be part of the least cost path from 1 to 6. So we only need to store the next node in the path, although you need to calculate the path. Do not copy from the lecture notes just yet, no. Yeah, no, it's not the same as on, on the central lines. You need to do this one, yeah. Anyone else have a? If, if there are two paths with the same cost, what, what should I choose? If there's two paths with the same cost, choose, choose one of them randomly. Least cost is, if you have two with the same cost, then you can use either one of them. It makes no difference in terms of total cost. Do you have a routing table? So in fact, to, to complete the table, you need to know what are the least cost paths. Even though you don't store the entire path, you need to know what it is. So if node 1 wants to reach node 2, what is the least cost path? Anyone have an answer? 1 to 2. That has a cost of 2. From 1 to 2, direct has a cost of 2. Are there any other paths from 1 to 2 with a cost lower than 2? The cost of 1? I don't think so. This is 5. 1 plus 2 is 3. You're not going to get lower than 2. So the least cost path from 1 to 2 is node 1 to node 2. The path cost was 2. So... That's the least cost path from node 1 to reach routing table for node 1 to reach the destination node 2. The next node in the least cost path is 2. That is for node 1 to get the data to node 2, it should send to node 2. And in fact, once it gets to node 2, we've reached the destination. <coughs> what about node 3? How do we go from node 1 to node 3? We need to find the least cost path and then find the next node from node 1. Least cost path from one to three. No, the, the least cost path is based on these numbers. The, the, these numbers indicate the cost. The hops is different. A hop, one, two, three hops, one, two hops, we are choosing the best path as the path with the least cost. 
where the cost indi is indicated by these numbers. So it's not about number of hops in this sense. Uh, again, we want to get from node 1 to node 3. What path do we take? Again? N1, N4, N3, and the cost is anything better? N1, N4, N5, N3 has a cost of 1 plus 1 plus 1, 3. You won't get better. That just indicates that even with a simple case, it's very easy to miss some of the paths. That's why we need computer algorithms to do this for us when we have large networks. So if we're at node 1 and we want to reach node 3, we send to node 4. So the next node, if we're at node 1 and we have a destination of node 3, send to node 4. And the path cost is 3 in that case. We just need to store the next node in the path. That's sufficient because if we get to the next node, that node will use the least cost path to the destination, which will be part of the least cost path from our original node to the destination. And we need to do that for the other destinations. We won't do it in all cases. N4 and N5. Least cost path to N4 is direct, 1 to 4. So this is a path from 1 to 4. The next node is N4. Just to be complete, we'll draw it here. N1 to N4. And N1 to N5. I think this path, N1, N4, N5, has a cost of 2. And the one that we had before was N1 to N6. We've already calculated that. Which is N1, N1, N4, N5, N6 and at a cost of 4. We've got that one here. N5. To reach N5, from N1, to reach N5, the next node is 4. And the cost of that path is 2. That's our routing table for node 1. Node 1 doesn't need a path to reach node 1. We just need a path to the five other nodes. And that routing table stores the five destinations and the next node in the least cost path to reach each of those five destinations. The cost information is not needed, but often included in practical systems. And then we'd need to do that for the other five nodes. From node 2 to reach 1, 3, 4, 5 and 6. What are the least cost paths? And therefore, what is the routing table for node 2? And same for node 3, node 4, node 5 and node 6. We can think each node would have a routing table similar to this, but of course with different data. The routing table is created from the least cost paths. So step one, or, or the first step we did here was to calculate the least cost path and then simply store the next node 
in each path in our routing table. We don't need to store the, the subsequent nodes because of our concept or the principle that if we, if the least cost path from N1 to N6 is 4, 5 and 6, then it means if we send to node 4, if node 4 wants to deliver to N6, then the least cost path from 4 to 6 will be 4, 5, 6. So from node 1's perspective, we just need to get the data to node 4. When node 4 has the data, node 4 will have an entry in its routing table. We won't draw the entire routing table, but from node 4's perspective, if the destination is node 6, the next node should be node 5. Why? Because our, the least cost path from 4 to 6, from here to here, is 4, 5, 6. Therefore, the next node is 5. So if node 1 sends to node 4, node 4 will send to node 5 to reach node 6. And similar, node 5 will send to node 6. And we're at the destination now. So we don't need the entire path. And that's the key point of routing tables. You should be able to construct a routing table for a simple network like this. Any questions before we move on? We will not go through and construct them all because we have them here. It takes too long. This slide gives us the routing tables for all nodes in that network. And it only lists the destination and next node. We see this is identical to this. From node 1, although the ordering is different, to reach node 2, next node 2, 3, next node is 4, 4, next node is 4, 5, next node is 4, 6, next node is 4. That is this information. And it's been calculated for those other five nodes as well. In, in the textbook, they're referred as routing directories. I prefer routing tables. It's, uh, I think, more common nowadays. Same concept. So each node stores their own routing table and when they receive a data packet, they simply look at the destination of that packet and look up the routing table to see who to send it to next. If node 2 has a packet and the destination is 5, node 2 has a packet, destination 5, node 2 will send to node 4. If node 4 receives the packet, the destination is still 5. Node 4 with a packet, destination 5, will send to node 5. And we can do that for other examples. This information effectively stores the least cost paths from any source to any destination. This is all we need to store to get our data across the least cost path. This example is if we have a distributed routing, distributed routing table. That is, each node stores its own information. The previous slide is an alternative. Maybe there's one special node in the network that stores all of the routing information. Then it would look like this. It's just a combination of those six tables into one where we read it as if we want to reach, if we are at node three, and we want to reach node 4, the next node is 5. If we're at node 5 and we want to reach node 6, the next node is 6. All this is is a, a combination of this information. We can see this column 
source node 1 to reach 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Next nodes are 2, 4, 4, 4, 4. That's this information. Source node at node 2 to reach the destination nodes 1, 3, 4, 4, 4. 1, 3, 4, 4, 4. So it's just centralizing the information into one database, into one table. Both of them contain the same information for routing. So that's, that's the concept of routing tables and, and the concept of fixed routing is build the network, calculate the least cost paths, store that information in routing tables, and then when you have data to send, use those routing tables to determine who to send it to next in the switch network. The general process I've summarized here. Learn information about the network status. That is, in order to calculate the least cost paths, I need to know what are the links, who are the nodes, and what are the costs of those links. I need to know this information to calculate the least cost path. So somehow we need to learn that information in the network. We know it in this example because we can see this. But in a real network, if we cannot see the entire network, we may need some protocol to learn that information. Send a request to other nodes saying, tell me about your links. So there may be different ways to learn that information. Once we know information about the network status, calculate the least cost paths from any source to any destination. That's what we did up there, but just for node one to other destinations. Store that path information in the routing tables where we only need to store the next node in the path. And now when we want to send data from some node to some destination, simply look at the destination address in that data packet and look up the routing table to determine which is the next node to send it to. The first three steps are part of the routing process. The fourth step is a part of the forwarding process, or we say simply forwarding. The first three are to create the routing table. The last one uses the routing table to send the data. In fixed routing, we do that at the start of the network, and in most cases, those routing tables stay the same during the operation of the network. If we have a quiz at the end of the lecture, you should be able to create routing tables for an example network. Any questions? You can create routing tables. In, in the quiz, you could create a routing table under pressure in 10 minutes. You need to know the concept. Of course, calculating the least cost paths is not trivial. You cannot do it easily because there's many possible paths. So in a small network, you can do it in your head on pen and paper. With a large network, you need some computer software to help in the calculation. I would normally not ask a quiz or even an exam question which has a network any larger than this, usually smaller. You know. Routing tables are used in the strategy three as well, adaptive routing, which we'll come to shortly. 
So in summary, with fixed routing, what we do? When do we decide the routes? Well, we decide them when we start the network. Let's say I go and build a network to connect. I create my own company, an internet service provider, and I build my own network across Thailand. When I build or design and build the network, at that point in time, I can calculate the least cost paths. I will program the routing tables into each of the nodes, and then they would be fixed while the network is running for the next one year. Unless there's a major change in the network, maybe I add some new nodes in six months' time, I may update the routes. So we create, or we decide on the routes when we start the network, which node chooses the route, we can either use a centralized approach where we have one table or a distributed approach. Both are possible. Centralized is usually okay for small networks. Distributed is usually for larger networks. Where do we collect the network information from? Or from all nodes? When I build the network, I know the entire topology of the network. I built it. I designed it. I know the capacity of all the links. I probably know the expected delay across the links, at least upon startup. So I use all the network information to make the calculation of least cost paths. When do we update this information? Never, hopefully, unless there's a major change in the network. That is, assuming that the network stays the same over that one year, the routes will stay the same. In practice, this is only used if we have small networks which don't change much, tens of nodes maybe. Maybe in SIT where we have several different packet switching nodes, maybe five or ten, we could use this approach because it doesn't change much. Strategy three is almost the same except we allow the tables to be updated over time. We adapt over time. But let's look at a completely different strategy first. So almost forget what we've said about routing tables. So let's look at strategy two, which is called flooding. The problem with what we just went through is that we need to learn about the network we need to do some calculations of least cost routes. That takes some time. We need to create the routing tables, store them in each node, and then use them. So there's some overheads in learning about the network and storing the information. There's some complexity involved when we have large networks with that routing. Flooding is a very simple approach. We don't use routing tables. We do not calculate least cost paths. What we do is send the data to everyone. We flood the network with data. In the previous approach, we calculated the routing tables, and when we had data to send, we used those routing tables. In flooding, there's just one step. When you have data to send, send to everyone in the network. If you send, so if I'm a source node and I have data to send, to a destination node, one of you in this class, so there's one student I want to send the data to. If I send to everyone in the network, everyone in the class, I will reach that one st student. So if I send to everyone, the data will get to the destination. It will also get to everyone else, but sometimes that doesn't matter. How do we send to everyone? What we do is we send in our network to our neighbor nodes and our neighbor nodes send to their neighbor nodes and they keep sending to their neighbor nodes until everyone's received a copy of that, that data. As a result, every node in the network receives a copy of the packet. Well, actually the steps. The source node sends a copy of the original packet to all of its neighbors. And all of those nodes send a copy of that packet to their neighbors and keep going. 
Each node that receives a packet forwards a copy of the packet to all of its neighbors. Eventually, everyone's received a copy of that one original packet. And therefore, the destination must have a copy. And we've delivered the data from source to destination. There's no concept of calculating routes. We just send across every possible route. All possible routes are used in the network. Because all possible routes are used, at least one packet will take the minimum hop route. Take the route which has the least number of hops. That can be useful if we want to use least hop routing or say set up a circuit which uses the least number of hops. We can flood a packet through the network. One of those packets will reach the destination across the least hop path. And then we can use that path to send our data in virtual circuit packet switching. So that's the, the, the point that one packet always takes the minimum hop route is an advantage of this scheme or a, a feature. All nodes receive a copy of the data. That's useful sometimes. If I want to distribute information to many nodes or all nodes in the network, then we can just flood the, flood the network with packets. And the key advantage, it's very simple. We don't need to learn information about the network status. We don't need to calculate least cost path. And we don't need to store data in routing tables. We just send the data. The disadvantage is it's very inefficient. To send one copy of data, one packet of data from source to destination, I actually must send many copies of that packet through the network. If my data has 1,000 bytes, I want to send one packet with 1,000 bytes from source to destination. I have to send that 1,000 bytes many times in the network. So it's very inefficient. We will see some, uh, some ways to increase the efficiency. But if we use these techniques to increase the efficiency, then sometimes a packet may not reach the destination. So later we'll see we can use some concept of a hop limit or selective flooding to increase the efficiency. But if we do use them, we may not reach the destination. And remember our original goal, send data from source to destination. If we send data and it doesn't get to the destination, we have a problem. Let's use an example to illustrate flooding. And we introduce some, some extensions or some, some features that make it a little bit more efficient uh, and more practical to use. In this case, node 1 wants to send one packet to node 6. 6 is the destination, 1 is the source. This is the topology of our network. We don't need to know anything about costs. We don't need that. What we do is we send a copy of that packet to all of our neighbors. Node 1 has three neighbors, 4, 2, and 3. It needs to send one packet, but it in fact sends a copy of that packet to each of its neighbors. So it sends three packets at the same time one across each of these three links. For now, ignore the number in the packet. We'll come back and explain that later. We'll keep it simple. We'll just send a copy of the packet, the same data, to each of the three neighbors. So node 2, 3, and 4 will receive a copy of this packet. When a node receives a copy of the packet, it sends to its own neighbors. So look at node 4. It received a copy of the packet. It makes copies of that same packet and sends to its neighbors. 2, 3, and 5. And the other neighbor of 4 is 1. So the first extension we have, or one of the rules of flooding, do not send a copy 
to a node has or that has already sent you a copy. Node 1 sent a copy of the packet to 4. When 4 receives that packet, it sends to its neighbours except node 1. There's no point to send back to 1 because node 4 knows that 1 just sent it to us. 1 already has a copy of this packet, we don't need to send it to them again. So node 4 receives and sends to all of its neighbours except who it's just received it from. So that's these three copies here. The same happens at nodes 2 and 3. 2 received a copy of the packet from 1 and sends to its neighbours. 3 receives a copy and sends to its neighbours. And it has 4 neighbours. They do not send back to 1. There's no need for that. Note that what's going to happen is that 4 is going to send a packet to 2 and 2 is going to send a packet to 4. They don't know the other one is sending the packet just yet. Next step. Send a copy of the packet to the neighbours. What's wrong with this one? Uh, it's okay. So let's focus on node 4. Node 4 sent to its neighbours. Node 4 is about to receive one packet from node 3 and a packet from node 2. So node 4 receives two packets. One from 2 and one from 3. And therefore from the packet from 2 it sends to its neighbours. So 4 received a packet from 2 so we'll send a copy of that to 3, 5 and 1. It doesn't send back to node 2 because it just received from node 2. So there's 1, 2, 3 packets sent there but also 4 received a copy from 3. So it makes copies of that and sends to its neighbours except 3 which are 2, 1 and 5. That's why we see node 4 sends two packets to 1, two packets to 5, one to 3 and one to 2. Because it, in fact it received two packets, one from 2 and one from 3. Copies sends to your neighbours except who you receive from. And the same happens at the other nodes. And you can see right, there are many packets being transmitted and they are all copies of the original one packet sent in the network. And that's where we see the inefficiency of this because to deliver one packet from one, from source node one to destination node six, we've actually been sending, let's count them, three packets plus all of these which is another four plus two plus three is a nine so we've got twelve packets transmitted so far three in the first phase, nine in this phase at twelve, plus all of these. What have we got? Six, four, that's ten, plus another four, fourteen, twenty-two packets there. Fourteen, twenty-two packets plus twelve, thirty-two packets have been sent so far. Just to get one piece of data from node one to node six. So in fact, to deliver one packet from source to destination, we've transmitted 32 or whatever it was, 30, approximately 30 packets in the network. That's very inefficient. If we used least cost routing, what we would have done, send one packet to four, one packet to five, and one to six. We would transmit, in the best case, three packets if we used least cost routing. With flooding, we've sent more than 30 packets to get that one piece of data from source to destination.
how many packets transmitted in the previous example, what we calculated 30 something, 32 or 34. You can add, add up those boxes and you'll get them. How much data was delivered to the destination? Well, just one, the intention was to get one copy of the packet to the destination. So just one packet delivered, but 30 packets transmitted. That's the inefficiency. Now let's introduce some new concepts to make it a little bit better. Transmit to our neighbours. That's the first rule. If do not transmit to the neighbours that just transmitted to you, that's shown here. Node 2 receives from 1, it transmits to its neighbours except node 1. So that's a rule to reduce the number of transmissions. There's no need to send back to the node that just sent the data to you because you know that node already has a copy. This step could be improved. Node 4 received two copies of the same packet. It didn't know that they were the same packet, so it simply sends a copy of the first packet to its neighbours and a copy of the second packet to its neighbours. As a re result, it sent six copies. Two to one, two to five, and so on. We don't need to do that. If the packets contain a sequence number, that identify the uniqueness of the data, then what we could have done, 4 receives this packet and this one. They both contain the same sequence number. 4 recognises, OK, I've received this packet already. Let's record the sequence numbers to illustrate this. Note that the numbers here are not sequence numbers. They're uh, the next thing we're going to cover. In the first step, node 1 sends a packet, and let's give that packet sequence number 1. Simple. That sequence number is carried in the header of the packet and is carried in all copies of the packet. So when node 1 sends to its neighbours, which are 3, 2 and 4, the packet sent from 1 to 4 contains sequence number 1. The packet sent from 1 to 2 contains sequence number 1. And the packet sent from 1 to 3 contains sequence number 1. So these numbers are not sequence numbers. <coughs> they are something else. If we include a sequence number, the next step, 2, 3 and 4 receive a packet. They send to their neighbours, except who they receive from. So 4 is going to send a copy of that packet with the same sequence number. All copies have the sequence number 1. We'll send a packet to 2. It will send a packet to 5 and also to 3. That's these three packets. Which are these three? All with sequence number 1. Similar. 2 sends packets to 2 and 4. And 3 sends to 2, 4, 5 and 6. Those four packets. So same number of packets now, but all containing the sequence number 1. Next step. Let's look at node 4. Node 4 receives this packet from 2. It receives it. It sees sequence number one. Ah, I've already received a packet with sequence number one. I've already sent it to my neighbours. I will not send it again. So, in this modified version, now when node four receives a packet with the same sequence number that it's received before, it does not send again. 
it discards that packet. So that's different from this example. 2 sends to 4 a packet with sequence number 1. 4 has some record. Packets already received and forwarded. And packet with sequence number one has already been received. We received it on the first instance and sent to our neighbours. So if we received a copy of the packet with the same sequence number, just ignore that packet. There's no need to send it to our neighbours again because our neighbours already have received it because we've already sent it to them. So now four receives this one, throws it away, discards the packet. Four will also receive this packet, sequence number equals one. We've already received it, discard this packet. So in fact, in our modified version, four does not send anything else on. In the original version, four sent these six packets on. By using sequence numbers, we can reduce the number of packets we retransmit increasing the efficiency. The same could be applied for the other nodes. With, they wouldn't have to retransmit these packets again. Using sequence numbers helps is it minimizes or reduces the number of transmissions in the network. How, uh, all right. in both cases, node six, the destination received a copy of the packet. In our original case, node six receives many copies of the original packet. One, two, three, four, here. In fact, in the previous, it received a copy here. So it's received multiple copies of the original packet from node one. It only needs one of them. The rest can be discarded from node six perspective. Because the goal was to get one copy of the packet from one to six. And that worked. By flooding, eventually a copy gets from one to six. And in fact, one of those packets that arrives at node six will take the least, will take a path with the least number of hops. We see that. This packet goes from one to three, then three sends a copy to six, and now six has got the packet. It took two hops. So that's an advantage of flooding. A packet will always take the least hop path from source to destination. There'll be other packets, but one of them will always take the minimum hop path. Six receive copies. Even if we have this enhanced form, six also receives copies of the packet. It may receive multiple copies. That's okay. One other extension. Okay. That's flooding. Send to all your neighbours with some minor enhancements. Don't send to the people who have already sent to you. Don't need to send again if, you've, if the sequence number is what you've already received and sent. And as a result, everyone receives a copy. Another extension we can include is a hop limit. In both cases, we still send many packets in the network. In this one, it was 30 plus packets. If we reduced, it would still be 10 to 20 packets transmitted just to get one from here to here. So they're still very inefficient. And another way to reduce the number of packets sent is to include it's listed somewhere, a hop limit. As well as the sequence number in the packet, include a hop limit. Set some initial value, let's say three. When someone sends a copy of that packet, they reduce the value. And that's what these numbers show. These numbers are hop limits. The original value is three. We send to our neighbors. When they send, 
they reduce the value to 2. They decrement by 1 and transmit with a hop limit of 2. And when they send again, they transmit with a hop limit of 1. And once the hop limit gets to 0, do not send. So it limits the number of hops that that packet will traverse. If the hop limit is 3, the, a copy of the packet will only be sent across 3 hops, after which a node will discard that packet, will not send again. With a hop limit of 3, our data reaches the destination. If we had a hop limit of 2, would the data reach the destination? Yes. That is, a hop limit of 2, initially 2, would send it to our neighbours. Node 3 would receive it, reduce it to 1, and send to node 6. 6 would receive it. What about this copy? If it was originally 2, it will be transmitted. 4 will reduce to 1, transmit. 5 will reduce to 0, will not transmit. So once it's at 0, do not send again. So receive, reduce, transmit if greater than 0. So this copy of the packet would go 1 to 4, and then 5 would just throw it away. It would discard that packet. But still, one copy went along this path and reached 6. A smaller hop limit reduces the number of packets transmitted in the network. With a hop limit of three, all packets will traverse three hops through the network. With a hop limit of two, only two hops. They go, they don't go as far. With a hop limit of one, they only go one hop. Even less packets transmitted, more efficient, but we have a problem. If a hop limit of one, the data won't get to the destination. The data will go from one to three, 3 will reduce to 0 and will not send on to 6. If the hop limit is too small, the data does not get to the destination and we have a problem. So a hop limit is a way to increase the efficiency, but if we set it to, to be a too small a value, then we may not deliver the data to the, to the destination. Last thing for today. Another way to increase the efficiency, with flooding, we send to all of our neighbours, except the ones who've already sent to us. With selective flooding, send to a selection of your neighbours. In flooding, full flooding, th node one sends to its three neighbours at the start. In selective flooding, Node 1 would select some of those three neighbours to send a copy to. And there are different ways to select your neighbours. You could take in turns. The first packet send to neighbour 3, the second packet to neighbour 2, the next packet to neighbour 4. Just send to one of the three neighbours. Or send to two of the three neighbours. Randomly choose a neighbour to send to. Choose a neighbour based on some probability. Of a thousand packets I want to transmit, send 60% to neighbour 2, 20% to neighbour 4, and 20% to neighbour 3. But randomly choose such that, that this one will see, receive a majority of the packets. So with selective flooding, we select, well, we only use a a subset of the neighbours to transmit to. Not just in the first node, but in each of the nodes. It reduces the number of nodes to trans that transmit packets, so it increases the efficiency. But again, it may be that a packet may not get to the destination, or a packet may take a long path to get to the destination. It may not take the least hop path to get to the destination. If I randomly chose to send to 4, and 4 ch chose to send to 3, and 3 chose to send to 5, and 5 chose to send to 6, we get to the destination, but the path is much longer than if we used full flooding and used two hops. So that's the trade-off that inc is incurred.
selective flooding examples send to your neighbours in taking in turns, send to neighbour one the first copy of a packet, send to neighbour two the subsequent packet you need to transmit, send neighbour three and take in turns, one, two, three, one, two, three. That's one example. Randomly choose your neighbours. You have three neighbours, just pick a random number and match that to one of the neighbours. So you just, again, randomly choose the neighbours. Choose neighbours based on uh, some probability based on the characteristics of the neighbours. If one link has a high data rate, use that link more often than the other links. So there are different ways to select the neighbours. We have a couple more minutes and we'll just finish and then allow us to move on next week. Adaptive routing, so two approaches so far. Strategy one, fixed routing. Learn about the network status, calculate the least cost paths, store that in the routing table, use that routing table to forward the data through the least cost paths. Strategy two, send to everyone, with a few exceptions. Very simple, you don't need all these steps, very inefficient. So it's only used for very special circumstances. Strategy three, use fixed routing except allow updates of the routing tables. That is, put this into an iterative process. Learn about the network, calculate least cost paths, store in routing table, Learn new information about the network, recalculate least cost paths, update the routing tables. Keep doing this over time. Adapt those routing tables. Because over time, the network status changes. The delay across links change, the throughput of links change, the congestion at different nodes change, and therefore the least cost paths may change. So that's what adaptive routing is. Using routing tables, same concept as fixed routing, except allows us to update over time. It requires nodes to learn the network status information. That is, we need to get continual updates about the network status. And then we just recalculate the routing tables. The more information we get about the network status, and the more frequent the updates are, the more likely the, the least cost paths we choose are optimal, are the best path. So the more updates and the more information collected, the better we are at choosing the best path. But the more updates and the more information we collect, that's a larger overhead incurred. Because collecting updates and getting them on a frequent basis requires transmission of uh, some overhead. Adaptive routing improves the performance of routing in a network in that we can potentially select the most or the best suited path to transmit our data. We balance the amount of traffic across the network. If it turns out one portion of the network is busy, there's congestion. Adaptive routing will allow the routes to be updated such that the new path from source to destination will avoid that busy location and send it across a less congested path. And therefore the traffic will be balanced across the network. That's a good thing. The disadvantage of adaptive routing, it becomes more complex. We need some algorithms to continually collect information and, and co continually update the selection of best paths. And the trade-off that we've just mentioned, the more information required for routing decisions and the more often the updates are delivered, then the more overhead in the network. That's a disadvantage. But of course, the more information we have and the more frequent the updates, the better the routes will be, the ones that we choose. If we get 
updates too frequently and we change our path too frequently when we may have unstable paths. Choose one path, send some data, then switch to another path, then switch back and switch back. This oscillation between paths can be a problem. If we react too slowly, then it may mean we receive, or we receive information that's re irrelevant. If I get updates once a year, that's not going to reflect the current status of the network. If I get updates once a minute, that may be okay. If I get updates once a second, then it may mean I choose a path which is good for that one second, and then the next second I choose a different path and another path, and we get oscillations between paths. So the update frequency needs to be chosen carefully. And that finishes it for today. What we've covered in routing, what is routing, fixed and adaptive routing, very similar. We use this concept of learn about the network information, find the least cost paths, store that in routing tables, and use the routing tables to deliver data. The difference is in adaptive routing, we continually do that. In fixed routing, we just do that at the start. A completely different approach don't do any of that, just send the data, copies of the data to everyone. Eventually the data will reach the destination. That's flooding. In the internet, adaptive routing is used. It's more complex, but it gives us better paths in, and it's much more efficient than flooding. Enough for today. We'll have a quiz next week and continue on with routing in the next topic on Tuesday, okay?